All right, without further ado, because I don't know how to say that, James. I've been made fun of all day <laughs> about how I can't say that or, or whatever it is, but without further ado, James Rapine. James, how are you doing, man? I, you're, you're busy, you're smiling. It's, it's gotta be a, a you, got, you got a little one. I remember you having a little one. How's life? Mm -hmm. Life's great. Yeah, no complaints here. Farther ado. I have not heard that. You're right. You can't yeah. say further ado, huh? I can't say farther ado. I don't, I don't know how to say it. I'm, I'm going to continue to say it wrong. You know why? Because in life, sometimes you realize you're not good at things. If, but if you admit that you're not good at it, then everyone else can't really make fun of you a whole lot. So that's what I'm hoping is going to happen. We'll see how it goes. Uh, all right. Not the best start for the Cincinnati Bengals, clearly. Uh, you go up to Cleveland. It feels like you have a chance to redeem the past. That didn't quite happen. Uh, now you look back in hindsight and you start to ask questions that maybe are meaningful, maybe they're not. The first question I have for you is, is do you think there's reasonable concern for fans that just don't think that Joe Burrow is actually healthy? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's reasonable because it was by far the worst game we've seen from him. He didn't look comfortable. And while you can say, oh, well, that's because of Cleveland's pass rush or the weather, all of these things, yesterday when he's asked about the calf, he doesn't want to say, oh, no, we're 100%. He doesn't go there. He's, he's very cryptic about it. And you, you, give a, you get a five-word answer about working through it when asked about how comfortable he is moving out of the pocket and stepping up and everything that goes with that. Now, maybe he's going to be completely comfortable on Sunday. But until we see that, all we have is what we've seen post-calf injury. And in that one game, obviously there were conditions that weren't great, especially for someone coming off of a calf injury, a calf strain. But he, he obviously didn't look like himself. So we will see, but I certainly get the concerns and understand them. And until we see him go out there and play like the normal Joe, I think that the calf injury is going to be a topic that we continue to discuss. Yeah, and to your point, I guess you could venture to say that that's a little bit of a crutch that people will use for Burroughs' play, but maybe perhaps he just had a, had a bad game, and that's what we get to find out this week if he's able to bounce back. And to, to Joe's point, I think he had mentioned something along the lines that uh, that there's a reason that that they've had success in the past, and it's because they've bounced back from performances like that before, and they plan to do it again. All right, a couple different other topics I want to get into. Lionel Collins, obviously, is a, is a, is a name that was highly regarded coming in from last uh, last season. He was, he was supposed to be Joe Burrow's bodyguard. It almost reminds me of just the stark reminder that is the NFL is the not-for-long league. And, and your overall thoughts on just what kind of his – I don't want to say career because it wasn't much of one, but – his tenure with the, uh, as a Bengal and what you felt like the, the, the real reason was behind why they decided to cut him. I know they said they liked their depth, but do you really believe that? What do you think the actual real reason was? It's dollars and cents and not physical dollars and cents. I, I don't think they have any problem spending on the offensive line. We've seen them do that over the past couple of years specifically, but it's more about, okay, you only have so much cap space to go around. You know who's coming up over the next year. T. Higgins, obviously, is a huge factor, but DJ Reader, Chidobe Awuzie, we could continue with guys that are, are going into contract years or could be extension eligible. We know Jamar Chase will be extension eligible next offseason. And they're clearing at least $13 million in cap space over this year and next year, maybe 14. It depends on if there was an injury settlement or not for Lyle Collins. We don't need to get into the weeds there. It's, it's pretty simple. He's 30. He's still not healthy. I, I think he was up and down in their eyes last year. And so do you want to commit that money to him this season when you know that there's a chance that he could contribute, but there's also a chance – where he's he's not contributing and not a factor. And that's the part of it I, I, that I think is interesting now. You save that money, but I think the door is cracked for Lyle Collins to return to Cincinnati. If he doesn't get scooped up over the next couple of weeks, let's say the Bengals have an injury in that offensive line room. We've seen that over the past couple of, of years, of, of course. I wouldn't be shocked at all if they reach out to, to Lyle Collins' agent and, and say, hey, well, let's try to make this work and bring him back. He knows the system and he can play right away. So I, I think that the door is cracked there at the same time. The Bengals save the cap space. And that's what this was to me, is a cap saving move over the next couple of years where they can apply that money elsewhere that they that they deem is, is going to be more valuable on, on, and more valuable players. 
Do you feel do you feel like guys understand that? Or do you do you, like Lyle Collins, if he were to get asked to come back in call it a month, is mm-hmm. is and, and you've obviously been around Lyle. Is he the kind of guy that's gonna have a, a little bit of a grudge there and feels like, hey, you guys just decided that you wanted to cut me to save some money and now you need me, so uh best of luck? Or is it one of those situations where most of these guys they get it, it's a business, it's part of it's a part of doing business and he'd happily come back. I know that's a very opinionated question, but just in your mm-hmm. general sense of being around this many guys in the locker rooms before, what what would be the thought of coming back if, if that were to be an option for Lyle? I, I certainly think he would be open to it. Now, the money has to be right. I don't know what the money would look like. The situation would be what it would have to be right. But Part of it was he's just not there yet. He's just not fully healthy. And whether it would take an, another month, another six weeks before he's out there, if you're the Bengals, do you want to commit that type of money, that type of cap uh, amount to a guy that could miss half the season at least and isn't projected to crack your starting lineup anyways? I I, I think that's the other part of this. So, no, I knowing what I know about Lyle, he loved playing for Zach Taylor, player's first coach, they certainly were were player friendly to him last year with how they managed him through back and ankle injuries. And I thought he was starting to reward them a bit before going down for the season on Christmas Eve. So we'll see. I could see him back at the same time. There's plenty of offensive line needy teams in the league, and I could see one of those teams going after him over the next month or so as he continues to get healthier and healthier. All right. Speaking of dollars and cents, uh, there's a, this guy that wears number five now that everybody continues to bring up in conversation after conversation about extensions or whether or not there's even Johnny room. Bench. Okay. Yeah, Johnny Bench. Johnny Bench is the is the guy that uh, most people are discussing these days. I'll tell you what, they probably have a bobblehead of him down at Great American Ballpark next week if you don't watch out. But that's here nor there. Um, T. Higgins, what's the expectation? Is there an expectation? Is it behind closed doors? Does everybody kind of know what's going on? Or is there still speculation? Is it up in the air? I know that uh, T and his team have kind of said they're putting football first. They'll worry about the extension later type thing. But at this point, it seems like the writing's on the wall. From the outside looking in, your overall thoughts on the extension and what the Bengals are going to do going forward. Here's why T's team would say that. Justin Jefferson's deal didn't get done. There are multiple receivers in that draft class that didn't get done. I don't think Brandon Ayuk has an extension in San Francisco. Like those are guys that you can look at and say, all right, well, this can give us a blueprint of where the receiver market's going versus where it is currently, because it's going to continue to go up. And so I get T's camp from that perspective. So that's why they're probably going to play it out. I don't anticipate a deal getting done between now and, you know, four weeks from now or any time during the regular season And that's another point as to why moving on from Lael, from a cap perspective, player-wise, I would love to keep him because he is great insurance. But from a cap perspective, if you can roll over the money you saved this year, at least $6 million in cap, plus the $7 million next year, that's over half of what the franchise tag is going to be for T. Higgins. So if you have to tag him, you have more space uh, to, to do so because that's what the Bengals have to do here. You can't just let T. Higgins walk. He's too talented, too valuable of a position, too hard to replace. I know people think receivers grow on trees and it's really easy to do. It's not. Ask the Titans. They probably wish deep down that they kept A.J. Brown. So if you're the Bengals, try to keep T. I think they're going to continue to to have dialogue with his his agent and, and hopefully keep him and sign him to an extension. But if not, you can fall back on that franchise tag. And if I had to guess today – Trace, that, that's where I think it goes, is the Bengals tag T. Higgins this coming offseason. He probably has a big year, despite what happened in Cleveland, and, and they place the franchise tag on him to keep him in town for at least one more season. All right, looking forward, obviously uh, the past – performance is something that hopefully you you kind of burn the tapes on everybody forgets about but it seems like one of those (laughs) games that that's pretty hard to do easier said than done as they say do you feel like there's any lingering effects at least being around the team from what happened this past Sunday or do you think they've completely moved on and they're ready to face the Ravens this Sunday oh I think they've moved on and this team is really good at doing that more so than than most teams I've been around. And I think it's because Burrow's able to set a tone, but these guys have just kind of uh, adapted to it. And and Chase has that same mindset and mentality. T, the same thing. Think about it with T Higgins. 
potential contract year. I know I just said the tag, but contract year, his first game goes horrible. Part of it's his fault, but certainly part of it's Joe Burrow's fault. And he doesn't have a catch. And I talked to him yesterday and there's no sign of that, no sign of frustration. I think they're just focused on the Ravens. So however they do it, I'm not sure I could do it that like they can. And maybe that's why they're professionals, but uh, they're able to compartmentalize. And I think they're focused full steam ahead on Baltimore. All right. Speaking of the Ravens, what what's the biggest takeaway as you look forward to this Sunday that you think that uh, in order for it to go a little bit better for the Cincinnati Bengals, this needs to happen? It's a difficult spot because the Bengals offense was awful on Sunday in Cleveland. And it's not like they performed well against Mike McDonald, the, the Ravens defensive coordinator last season. Three matchups. They were all one score games. They were all kind of slug fest and I know that end of season game the regular season game with the coin flip was kind of weird and it was hard to stay focused even for me it was hard to stay focused so I'm sure the team struggled there but the offense it's not like they dominated and so it, it's a, a tough position to be in but if you were going to play the Ravens this might be the week because they're probably going to be without Ronnie Stanley their starting left tackle their starting center Tyler Linderbaum who's arguably their best offensive lineman and not just there. They're going to be out without Marlon Humphrey, Marcus Williams, a cornerback in safety, arguably two of their three best defensive players. It's a banged up secondary. They're missing some weapons. J.K. Dobbins tore his Achilles last week, which sucks, but it's it's really unfortunate. But he's a big part of their offense. So they're shorthanded. And, and if you're the Bengals, you have to take advantage on both sides of it. And, and going into this game, there's a few questions. Can you solve the Mike McDonald riddle? That is the the Bengals offense has stubbed their toe on last season three times. And if you do that, then, okay, what about Burrow's health? And then the other part, of course, is Lamar Jackson because he's always the wild card. It, can you contain Lamar Jackson? They have plenty of experience doing it. They're going to have to do it again on Sunday. All right, final question. You mentioned T. Higgins obviously having zero catches. I'd also venture to say that Jamar Chase is in the same camp. I know he, he obviously at least – caught a ball, but as far as effectiveness and as far as successful, uh, a successful game to the eyes of, of Jamar Chase, I expect that he wouldn't have been too pleased. Is that group, if you will, that is uber talented, right? I mean, you could make the case that that's the best receiving core in the entire NFL. Do you feel as if that there are no lingering effects at all and Jamar Chase doesn't have any kind of, uh, I guess, apprehensions of what happened? last Sunday, or or I guess to your point, have they all moved on? I, I think they've, they're they hungry to get out there and and have some success from, th from that aspect. I, I think they were pretty angry after the game and, and how it went, and that's about as frustrating of an offensive performance as you could have, you know, in a video game, let alone real life. And, and they had to re, they had to live it and then relive it on the plane ride home, and then again on Monday as they looked at film. So yeah, I, I expect Jamar Chase, especially against the banged up secondary. I really want to hammer that home. No Marlon Humphrey, assuming he doesn't make, he didn't practice on Wednesday, didn't play last week. I don't think he's going to play. Marcus Williams definitely isn't going to play. You got to be able to take advantage now, even if Burrow's at 85% and not doing everything with this offensive line, you need them to take a step forward. It isn't that Cleveland front. So you got to find a way to get the ball to your weapons in space. So we'll see if they can do that. That's certainly my expectation is for them to get into a rhythm. It might not be lights out Bengals offense, but it needs to be much, much better than it was last week. Well, it's not going to be much of an easier task. Obviously, the Ravens are, are, are known for their defense for a reason. We'll see you and we'll find out and we'll talk about it again. James, I appreciate you coming on this show. I am not Tom. And uh, without further ado, I think I'll let you go. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. All right. See you, James.